It's time to run the fuel lines on my Cummins Swapped Explorer project. I've decided I'm going to remove all the stock fuel lines and replace them with AN lines. This is my first time using AN lines and I had to do a bunch of research to figure it out, so I figured I'd format this video as a bit of a guide to an AN diesel fuel system to put all this information into one place. If you are wanting to run an AN based fuel system on your car, and for some strange reason it isn't a 12 valve swapped explorer, stick around and you should still be able to get most of the information you need from this video. Teach a person to fish or something. AN stands for Army Navy. It is a standard for hoses and fittings that was developed jointly by the US Army and the US Navy. The fittings use a 37 degree flare and they're specified by their dash number, for example, AN-8 or AN-6. The dash number refers to the outside diameter of the hose, or the OD. This is somewhat peculiar for tubing since the dimension of interest in tubing is usually the inside diameter, or ID, not the outside diameter, since the inside is where the fluid is. However, this does make the fittings and tubings easier to identify without needing to take them apart. The dash number is the diameter in sixteenths of an inch. For example, a dash eight line is an eight sixteenths line, also known as half inch. A dash six line is six sixteenths, also known as three eighths. Here is a table from Wikipedia which you can use to get an idea of what the inside diameters actually are, which can be useful com to comparing them to other hose and pipe standards. For automotive, there's two common types of line material that are used. Both type of lines are typically braided, which provides abrasion resistance, and without this abrasion resistance, it would be a lot riskier to use flexible tubing to run a whole fuel system since the chance of the lines rubbing and then leaking and your vehicle subsequently burning to the ground would be much higher. First type of tubing uses a rubber hose with a braided outside. Specifically, the rubber is chlorinated polyethylene, which is also known as CPE or PEC. This tubing is good for oil, gas, and diesel, however it isn't as good with ethanol or with biodiesel. If you are wanting to run either of these fuels, instead you should get a hose with a PTFE liner. PTFE is the common name for Teflon, and like all fluoropolymers, it is incredibly resistant to most chemicals, and it's also very slippery, which provides low resistance to flow. PTFE hoses, however, have a much thinner wall than CPE hoses, meaning in general the fittings are not compatible. Be sure you buy fittings designed for the hose material you are using since the inner diameter is different between the hose materials even if they're using the same dash number. The size of fuel line you decide on is up to you. The biggest considerations are first, how much power do you want to make, and second, how much resistance to flow is in your fuel lines. This resistance to flow can be due to an excessive use of fittings, or just due to the length of tubing as well as the smoothness of the tube itself. However, the easiest way to avoid having to worry about pressure losses is to simply increase the size of the hose or tubing, especially if you're converting from hard lines which inherently have less pressure loss than flexible lines to begin with, stepping up in sizes can be useful. Additionally, pressure losses are reduced very quickly as you increase the diameter, and the flow rate increases very quickly as well. For example, if you go from a dash six line to a dash eight line, even though you've only increased the diameter by about 30%, you've increased the cross-sectional area, and thus the flow rate, by about 69%. Nice. This happens because the cross-sectional area of a tube is a function of the square of its diameter. A small step up in line size can go a long way to account for friction losses and ensure your engine is getting enough fuel. But you don't need to overdo it since the flow rate increases very quickly with the diameter. If you're wanting to know which size line to use on say a 12 valve Cummins, dash six line is similar to the stock size. However, since it's a Cummins and I know you're going to want to turn it up at least a little bit, I personally think dash eight is a good compromise on performance and cost. If you're wanting a crazier build though, say 500 horsepower plus, then you're definitely looking at getting an electric push style pump rather than a stock lift pump anyways and you should probably see what that lift pumps manufacturer recommends for your line sizes. Additionally, keep in mind that the stoichiometric ratio for ethanol fuel is much lower, meaning you require way more fuel per air molecule used, so you'll have to use even bigger lines if you're planning on running ethanol. When I'm talking about these sizes, I'm referring to the feed lines here. The return fuel line can be a size smaller than the feed line, since obviously the return line sees less fuel. However, in my case, to avoid having to buy two different size fittings, I just went with dash eight for both feed and return. So what I ended up using was dash eight rubber lines instead of Teflon, since I don't see myself ever running biodiesel or pushing crazy amounts of horsepower in an Explorer, but 
I guess that depends on your idea of crazy. To feed fuel into the engine, the stock fuel lines run straight into your lift pump on the engine. The lift pump inlet on my engine is a 3 8 18 NPT thread, and so I purchased a 3 8 NPT to AN adapter to feed the lift pump. Small note here, NPT fittings don't use a flare or an o-ring or anything like that to seal, so you will need a pipe sealant of some type on the threads, otherwise it will leak. Either Teflon tape or pipe dope. NPT threads are tapered, so don't over tighten them. As a rule of thumb, hand tighten and then add two to three turns for fittings less than an inch in diameter. Next, I want it to go to AN with a 90 degree to a hose adapter. So I need to get the hose on this hose adapter. To connect an AN hose to a fitting, first remove the female portion of the fitting and push it onto the hose. Make sure that you don't have a lot of loose braiding that might get stuck in the fitting and cause a leak. Then add a small amount of oil to the tip of the male fitting and push the hose female fitting combo onto the male fitting. Twist the hose until hand tight and then add a couple turns. Since AN fittings seal using a flare, they do not need to be super tight. Be careful not to over tighten these as well. If you're building a show car and don't want to scratch the anodized finish on your fittings, then I recommend getting an aluminum wrench and soft jaws for your vise. I opted to just use the normal vise jaws and a crescent wrench since I don't care too much on this vehicle. Next I needed to cut the lines to size. I first tried doing this with a hacksaw and unfortunately it left lots of shavings in the line and I had to clean out the lines with compressed air and diesel. I'd recommend using a large pair of hose cutters instead of a hacksaw. The return line uses a banjo bolt. This is like a normal bolt, but with holes drilled in it to allow fuel to flow through it. The outside diameter of this bolt on my engine was about 14 millimeters, so I purchased an M14 to AN adapter to connect the AN lines. On a 12 valve, the banjo bolt also contains an overflow valve, which sets the pressure on the low pressure side of the system. If the pressure in the system exceeds the spring force on the banjo bolt, then the fuel is allowed to flow back to the tank. Once your fuel system is connected at one end of your vehicle, you will need to mount and support the hoses to get it to the other end of the vehicle. Personally, I chose to use double line clamps, which were cheap, easy to connect, and very sturdy. Keep in mind when ordering these that the dash number of the tubing won't necessarily correspond to the inside diameter of the clamp you need. For example, the clamp that fits my dash eight or half inch outside diameter line is actually a three quarter inch inside diameter clamp. Check with the seller of your line for the actual outside diameter before you order your clamps. In addition to the line clamps, I also use zip ties for less critical routing, such as just keeping the lines tidy as they go from the engine to the frame. Here's a quick zip tie trick to hold two lines together like this. So one zip tie holding them together, and then another zip tie used as a spacer. This not only keeps the line looking nice, but it also leaves a small gap between the lines so they don't rub on each other. Keep in mind I'm not using the zip ties to support the weight of the line anywhere. That's done with double line clamps. Fuel tanks typically use SAE quick connect fittings. These fittings seal using an o-ring on the inside and stay connected via a plastic clip. To figure out the size, measure the outside diameter of the male fitting. On my Explorer, I had a 5 16th return and a 3 8 feed and ordered appropriate AN adapters to suit. I'm going to put a link to all these different fittings and hoses that I use down in the description. If you're doing this yourself, I'm not necessarily recommending you get these exact same fittings, unless you happen to be putting a 12 out in a Ford, of course. Instead, hopefully it'll be useful for a reference for your build so you can get a better idea of what I'm talking about with all these fittings. With the fuel system fully connected, what I needed to do next was prime the system. I basically just kept pumping on the priming knob on the lift pump and I could hear air squealing through the overflow valve and I kept pumping it until I no longer heard that squealing and I heard what sounded like liquid instead of air. Fuel lines are in and now I think it's time to test start this thing. So there's a couple reasons that I want to do that. The first one is I want to make sure that there's no fuel leaks anywhere on it. And the second thing is I want to make sure that when this thing starts and vibrates, it's not running into the frame anywhere. And third, I just want to hear it run.
In order to test start it, I'm going to have to fill this whole thing with about $300 worth of fluids and I also need to figure out something to make sure that it doesn't spit coolant all over my floor. If I just take the serpentine belt off, then I don't have to worry about any of these lines being blocked off because nothing's going to be turning. So this thing will be able to run for a short period of time without coolant in it. It should be fine. They say it only takes two wires to start and run a Cummins, and that's a little bit of an exaggeration. I suppose if you had the full wiring harness on the engine and you never took it off, that might be true, but I count about six wires. So first off, you need a big positive running to the starter. That goes directly to the battery. And then you need a small positive running to the coil on the starter, which is actually what engages it. On mine, I have this little wire going to the starter, and you can see the wires open right now. And if I connect this spade, the wire is no longer open, it'll be closed, and the engine will turn over. Just like that. A ground, a big positive on the starter, and then the little field coil wire. That'll get the engine turning over, but it won't get it running because it won't have fuel. In order to give it fuel, you need to actuate this solenoid, which pulls up on a lever on the fuel pump and allows fuel to go through. This solenoid, first you need to pull it up and then you need to make sure it stays up while you're running. So there's three connectors. The first one is a black, which just goes straight to ground. The second one is red. That's the hold in. That's after it comes up, that's the one that keeps it up. And then the white one is the pull in. That's the one where when it gets power, it pulls it up, but it doesn't actually hold it. I have the hold in red wire wired straight to the battery. I have the ground black wire going to a ground. And then I have this spade connector here so that when I connect it, I can move this arm up and down. So if you watch this arm right here, when I connect this wire, it moves up. I let go of the wire and it's still up. And then if I disconnect that wire, it moves down. Notice if I connect this wire, it does not move back up. That's the hold, this is the pull. Two positives to the starter, one of them on a switch to engage it, a ground to the block, and then three wires to this, re to this solenoid, and that's what it takes to get this thing running. It might be blood, it might go. Yeah, there's smoke over here, so it kicks.
Well, she runs. That was way easier than I thought it would be. I can't believe how anticlimactic that was. The only bleeding that it took was priming it, which I did yesterday. It didn't take any bleeding while I was cranking it or anything. It just started. No ether, no nothing. So, I mean, boring is good. I'm glad there was no drama, but maybe I need to go invent some in order for it to be interesting on YouTube or something. I don't know. Anyways, it doesn't run into the chassis anywhere. Fuel system works. There's no leaks in the fuel system. No leaks in the transmission or the transfer case. Um, I did get a small oil leak because the dipstick tube is broken at the bottom, but I already knew that. I just need to get a new dipstick tube. Other than that, again, that was way too easy. So I'm happy with that. And not only did it start easy, but even just installing the fuel system was pretty easy. Every single fitting I bought was the right fitting, even though I had to mix a bunch of NPT and banjos and SAE quick disconnects all with AN. Even though I was doing all that, Still got all the fittings right, ended up with no extra fittings except what came in the pack with the fuel line that I knew would be extra. And I didn't have to frantically rush to the store to try and get fittings because I had the wrong ones. So everything went pretty smoothly. It's nice when it goes easy for once. Thanks for watching. Hope you learned something or at least found it interesting and subscribe and stick around if you want to see the next one and hope to see you next time.